Good evening and welcome to the October 28th, 2024 City Council meeting. I am Mayor Ross and tonight's meeting is being brought to you live using video conferencing technology provided by Zoom. So tonight's recording will be posted on the city's YouTube channel. So welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us. City Clerk Dean, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Benson. Here. Councilmember Watton. Here. Councilmember Holloway. Here. Councilmember Washington. Councilmember Cotton. Here. Councilmember Christensen. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Mayor Ross. I am here. Um, Councilmembers, we haven't heard from Councilmember Washington. Um, do you wish to move to a excuse. motion to excuse? Okay. So we moved by Mayor Pro Tem Holloway and second by Councilor Christensen. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? And Councilor Washington is excused. Moving on, please stand and join us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll have Councilmember Christensen please lead the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We now move to our first item of regular business is to approve the agenda. Council Mary, I have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. We move by Mayor Pro Tem Holloway, second by Councilor Johnson. Is there any discussion? Mayor Pro Tem Holloway. Would like to uh, have an executive session at the end of this in regards to potential litigation. Is there a second? Second. Any addition, anything else? I mean, Additions? No? Okay. Voting on the adding the executive session. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed nay? Going back to the overall agenda, including the executive session. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? And the agenda is approved with the executive session. Next item, we have a presentation this evening with King County Library System. Tonight we have Mary Comstock. Um, he's the King County Library Regional Manager here to present. Thank you, Mayor Ross. Hello, Council. We are very excited to be here tonight to talk to you about the year so far at the Snoqualmie Library. Uh, as Mayor Ross mentioned, my name is Mary Comstock, and I'm the Regional Manager of what the King County Library System calls the Cascade Region, which includes the Fall City, North Bend, Redmond, Redmond Ridge, Sammamish, and Snoqualmie Libraries. And of course, we're here to talk about Snoqualmie. Do you mind going to the next slide? Tonight with me is John Kim, our Librarian and Information Services Manager, Jennifer Loomis, our Children's Services Librarian, and Jen Pinto is our Teen and Adult Librarian. She cannot be with us tonight, but we wanted you to hear her name, and we're looking forward to you meeting her. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about our collection first. As librarians, we call what's on our shelves and in our e-book and e-audio collection, as well as our databases, our collection. Um, at the Snoqualmie Library, as you can see from the slide, we have almost 25,000 items in the collection. Um, there are 48% that are less than five years old, so we keep this collection fresh for the city. Um, in 2023, we had 122,000 checkouts, that's physical checkouts, and then about 85,000 in the e-collection. There on the right is just a comparison to our close-by libraries as far as the size of their collections. And as a sake, for the sake of comparison, this is the King County Library System as a whole. We have 49 libraries, and you can see the numbers there are, of course, higher than at the Snoqualmie Library, but we are one big happy library family, and all patrons can access these items through their holds. These are some of our statistics for year to date. We have two more uh, months left to go. And you can see that we have quite, we've had quite a few library visits this year, almost 45,000. We have a lot of active borrowers, and about 800 of them are new this year. You can see the other totals, including the computer sessions with 18 public computers. I want to add that the North Bend Library just closed due to the roof repair. Some of you may have heard about that. So the North Bend Library patron holds have moved over to the Snoqualmie Library for checkout. And we imagine that this library visit number 
and the actual physical checkouts are going to go up substantially because we're really combining two libraries in one right now for six weeks, that is. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Loomis, who's going to talk about some of our fantastic programs. I also want to point out that you do have a handout with you at your um, table, and a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight do reference the things that are on the slide. So please feel free to take a look and take it with you. Jennifer. Thank you, Mary. I wanted to highlight partly just how much of our work depends on partnerships, including with the city of Snoqualmie and so many departments. Um, a real high point has been our work with Nicole Wiebe, your community liaison, who has been instrumental in bringing us to bigger events than the library could get to on its own, such as Big Truck Day, Winter Lights, um, the recent Trick or Treat with the Ridge mer Merchants, um, and often these involve other partnerships as well. Um, we were also delighted to welcome Fire Chief um, Michael Bailey and Nicole and Mayor Ross this summer for a special visit from the fire truck that was beloved by our many patrons. Um, we're also delighted to be partnering with the police department and um, happy for our first time of participating in National Night Out this year, and we look forward to many more, and also um, quarterly meetings to build a stronger relationship together. Um, another notable one is the Arts Commission. Um, Yiju Miller from the Arts Commission and the Snoqualmie Art Gallery, along with Nicole Wiebe, partnered with us to host a lovely watercolor and painting class this year, um, among other things which we hope to do in future. And uh, we've also been very happy to host some beautiful murals from the Arts Commission in the past. And we look forward to continuing collaborations, uh, including our quarterly meetings with Mayor Ross. And now Jong has a little more for us on some other things. Uh, some of our other partners that we've been lucky to uh, work with have included Snoqualmie Valley School District, uh, Encompass Northwest, Snow Valley Chamber of Commerce, Trail Youth, Empower Youth, and Everyone in the Healthy Community Coalition, Friends of the Snoqualmie Library, which provide library programming support, uh, Snoqualmie Indian Tribe, YMCA, and the Northwest Railway Museum, and uh, last but not least, Key Bank. I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer to talk about programs. Just to give you a sampling of the kinds of things the library routinely does and what we've done this year, we've got some examples on that slide of events both for adults, and I should say the weaving circle is actually for teens and adults, so there's always a lot of crossover. Um, frequency of programs ranges from the weekly story times for families with young children to monthly programs for a wide range of ages. Um, and then we have multi-month series such as the financial literacy programs with KeyBank. And then the special and occasional programs such as the collaborations with the Master Gardeners. So we are very happy always to be connected as many, in as many ways as we can throughout the community. Thank you. Mary, did you have any closing? I want to add that the um, strategic focus of the King County Library System is to create opportunity for meaningful connection. And we believe that uh, we are really doing that in the Snoqualmie area. Um, our librarians do a lot of, re of outreach to different community organizations. And of course, that includes the city. So we are very grateful for the city staff that have been working with us. And um, we think that together we can serve our common goals and we very much appreciate having this chance to just talk to you for a little bit about what's happening. And if we can go to the next slide. If you have questions for us, I think we have a little bit of time. So we're happy to entertain those. And that can be about any questions you might have, including uh, what we're reading. Uh, Councilor, do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes, Councilor Benson. I assume that <clears throat> the 48% of uh, books and items in the library that are l less than five years old. Those are new copies of, they're not written in the last five years. I'm hoping that uh, we're talking about, um, you know, you got, you got Mark Twain in there and everything, right? Absolutely. Okay. And he hasn't come out with anything new. <laughs> not since I last checked. No, um, that is, that's a very good point. So we have, of course, new authors, new titles all the time. The publishing industry is very active. However, we want to keep the collection fresh on the titles that are what we would call the canon. So talking about Mark Twain, as well as replacing copies of items that are popular, but no, no longer new. Um, or ones that we just want to make sure they're on the shelf. They're important to this community. 
Um, and we know that because we, we talk to our community members and follow our circulation statistics pretty closely. So that, that's a very good point. I think I'm always, always impressed with the um, overall circulation statistic and, and the number of checkouts in the nation. And so can you remind us of, you, you're usually like one or second, probably second in the nation? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so we're usually neck and neck um, with the Queens Public Library. I know, I know the people think, well, the New York Public Library, that must be it. But actually Queens circulates more than New York Public. Um, I don't know why, but that's who we're usually neck and neck with. We also have a um, automated handling system at our Preston location where they do all of our sorting of our items. If you're interested in um, what that looks like, we're, we're kind of an early adopter of artificial intelligence. We've had that for over 12 years, the automated handling system. If you go to YouTube and just put KCLS Preston, you'll see how that works. We do a sorting contest every year to see who can sort the most items in a certain period of time. It's usually on that too, um, us and Queens. So we're kind of, uh, not that we're competitive, not at all. Any other questions for us? Councilor Johnson? Yeah, just uh, curious what happens to uh, donated books that were uh, well intended but are either um, not something that is a highest priority to be on the shelves, mm -hmm. you know, like first edition physics textbook from like 1980s. Uh, or Now there's physics lovers uh, out there, but yes, I understand. They probably don't have too much space on the shelf. Um, okay. Or, or books that are just uh, too well loved? Um, is there either a recycling program or is there somewhere else they go off to? Yeah, so two questions there. So the first yeah. is what about donated books? So our donate the books that are brought into the library system as donations actually go to our friends of the library. So we don't accept donations to go on the shelf for checkout. Mm -hmm. It actually costs us money to take donations and then do the original cataloging on it, make them ready for circulation, meaning they gotta be able to stand it, you know, to be able to stand the wear and tear, and then also to do the spine label, which is really the last and least expensive process. It's really the cataloging that's expensive. So when we get donations, we provide them to our friends who then turn around and sell them at very, very reasonable prices and all the money comes back to the library for programs and services. What about the items though that we do own that maybe they're well loved, a little grubby is the word we use. Um, so if they're okay enough, we will turn them over to our King County Library System Foundation for sale, and then that money comes back into the library system, generally through resellers. If they're so well-loved that that's just not gonna work, then we would recycle them. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, right. I really thank you. Um, you we're, you've always been a good partner, KCLS has, and you also have great programs for all ages for our community. So thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much. I hope we see you all in the library. If you don't have a library card, we can take care of that for you and all of you as well. So thank you for letting us come tonight. We appreciate thank you it. Thank you very much. Thanks. And we do have a big agenda, so don't, you don't have to feel obligated to stay, but you're welcome to. Yes. There you go. <clears throat> so our next proclamation is Kindness Month. So whereas the city of Snoqualmie honors those, no matter how young or old, that make a positive difference in our community and our whole world, whereas the Empower Youth Network's Youth Suicide Prevention Program, which includes the Be Kind SV campaign, makes your schools, communities, and states stronger by facilitating meaningful change through simple acts of kindness. And whereas any day, week, or month is a good time to remind all of us of the need to re remember the compassion, empathy, humility, and respect are essential ingredients in the creation and maintenance of a kind and civilized society. And whereas kindness is a fundamental part of the human condition, which bridges the divides of race, religion, politics, and gender, and whereas by knowing, understanding, and using our power of kindness, we have the ability to send out a positive ripple that may travel throughout the Snoqualmie Valley and beyond. And whereas by fostering acts of kindness within our community, we help our residents develop a thoughtful foundation and perspective within themselves and those around them. And whereas through simple acts of kindness, we can promote healthy behaviors and positive dynamics within our community. 
And whereas we seek to cultivate caring, kindness, and compassion within our community, now therefore I, Catherine Ross, Mayor of the City of Snoqualmie, do hereby proclaim November 2024 as Kindness Month in the City of Snoqualmie and recognize World Kindness Day on November 13th, 2024. And I believe we have um, Sarah Tarp, our Prevention Program Manager of Empower Youth Network with us tonight. And do you want to say a few words? Thank you for being here. Hi, guys. Um, again, my name is Sarah Tarp. I'm the Prevention Program Manager at Empower Youth Network, which is just a fancy way to say that I get to lead this amazing campaign and some of our other suicide prevention um, programs that we have at Empower Youth Network. First of all, I want to thank you for your leadership and work um, and joining us in kindness by in kindness by proclaiming November as Kindness Month in the Snoqualmie Valley. Empower Youth Network is hosting a series of activities throughout the month of November in celebration of Kindness Month, promoting caring, kindness, and compassion within our community. EYN's Youth Suicide Prevention Program, which includes our hashtag BeKindSV campaign, makes our schools, communities, and states stronger by facilitating meaningful change throughout simple acts of kindness. More than ever, our community can benefit from this campaign. EYN is grateful for the support of this community and with this effort. In addition to the city of Snoqualmie, the following entities and communities have traditionally joined together with the proclamation of November as Kindness Month. The Snoqualmie Indian Tribe, the cities of North Bend, Carnation and Duval, the town of Fall City, the Riverview and Snoqualmie Valley School Districts. No, Kindness Month activities are detailed as um, a few different opportunities, which includes nominating a kindness ambassador, which is a great way to highlight different kindness and people that you see in the community that we will highlight throughout the month of November. We as well have a free showing of Charlotte's Web at the North Bend Theater on November 10th, which is an amazing way for people of all ages to come together and celebrate kindness um, through an amazing movie such as Charlotte's Web. We look forward to celebrating kindness in our community with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for, for Sarah, Empower Youth Network? I will leave some flyers over on the table regarding the Kindness Month and if you want to nominate a kindness ambassador. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. This, at this time, we will provide time for residents to comment on items not on the agenda. There will not be online public comments. Written comments are encouraged and may be submitted in person by mail or email to cityclerk at snokamiwa.gov. And so, is there anyone in the chambers that would like to have public comment? Seeing none, we, public comment is closed and we will now move on to the consent agenda, which contains the approved the city council meeting minutes dated October 14th, 2024, approved the <laughs> Claims Report dated October 28, 2024, AB 24-099, NORCOM Budget Allocation, AB 24-113, Police Station Security Improvements. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Holloway and second by Councilor Cotton. Is there any public comment regarding any of the items on the consent agenda? Seeing none, Councilor, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? And the consent agenda is unanimously approved. Next item is ordinances. This evening, the mm -hmm. first ordinance is AB 24-055, amendments to Snoqualmie Municipal Code Titles 14 and 15, implementing Senate Bill 5290. So this is the second reading of Ordinance 1293. Councilor Johnson, would you please read the introduction and motion? The requirements of Senate Bill SB 5290 pertain to the timelines by which local jurisdictions planning under the Growth Management Act must process certain permit applications and encourages those jurisdictions to adopt additional um, to adopt optional strategies to promote compliance with those timelines. <clears throat> jurisdictions that do not achieve compliance with permitting deadlines may be required to refund portions of permit fees. The proposed text amendments would bring the Snoqualmie Municipal Code into compliance with the requirements of SB 5290. Cities are required to comply SB 5290, probably with SB 5290, as of January 1st, 2025, or the deadlines in SB 5290 will be imposed on the city. 
Move to adopt Ordinance 1293, amending the Snoqualmie Municipal Code to comply with the requirements of Senate Bill 5290. Second. Been moved by Councilman Johnson and second by Mayor Pro Tem Holloway. Is there any public comment regarding this item? Seeing none. I would just like to point out on this item, we did identify um, a, an omission, if you will, uh, in the strike through, um, there is a slight conflicting provision. Um, sign permits are, sign permits and one other category permit are exempted from this table, but in the table they're listed. So we would propose to uh, modify the strike through to add a footnote, um, just clarifying that. So moved. Second. It moved by Councilor Johnson, second by Councilor Benson, to add a footnote on the provision that has been striked through, or you need to strike it through? We we will, um, the footnote will remove the conflict that's currently in the strike through. Okay. Where, where is, where yeah, is the strike? page? See this on the screen, please? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, let me. So just to clarify, <clears throat> it's the uh, table can tell you it's table on page uh, four, four carried over to five uh, of the proposed uh, code amendments. The table currently includes a lot line adjustment and a sign permit um, as being subject to the 65 day permit processing timeline. So can we put that up there? Mm. Let me just join as a panelist and I'll be able to share my screen. So the provision here that the city attorney identified is uh, the lot line or boundary adjustments and sign permits not requiring design review are exempt from these provisions or they would be. Um, however, that's not the intent here we are intending. So they're exempt, but then if you look down in this table, table one, um, you'll see that for example, lot line adjustment is subject to a 65 day uh, permit application processing time timeline. And so our proposal would be to clarify that um, it, as of using a footnote uh, to this table that those permit applications are indeed exempt from these requirements. Mayor Pro Tem Holloway. You must get me out because I'm a little confused. Yep. The, the text contradicts the table, and I'm going to resolve that by a footnote to the table. Why don't I resolve? Why don't I correct the text? So the way the reason this table is formatted this way is it's just in in the code it specifies the different categories of permits and how they're proce processed, and so um, the function so to to peel out the lot line adjustment and sign permits not requiring design review from this table um, might make it more confusing for staff to use our proposal is essentially to take the language that's in this uh, exemption and copy it so that it's down below the table where there all are already a number of footnotes uh, that um, resolve places where there could be inconsistencies in the code or add another layer of regulation. I'm still having yeah. problems, guys. It doesn't, when you explain it, it logically doesn't make sense. If the text above is incorrect or needs modification, why not do that versus have it contradict the table because if you don't touch it, it still contradicts the table and have that contradiction resolved by a footnote. Our city attorney, David Linehan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, I'm, I'm not going to make a recommendation for how to fix it because I think you could fix it two opposite, completely opposite ways. Um, so that's, I think, for you and staff to, to decide. But um, that table is a summary of various um, 
requirements that each of those categories of permits are, are subject to. Um, the text above says that the lot line adjustment and sign permits not requiring design review are exempt from the requirements of the table. I don't know if that if that's supposed to mean that it's exempt from all the requirements of the table, or that's just intended to mean it's exempt from the new 65-day timeline that's been added to the table. So I'm not sure what the right answer is because I don't know what the intent was. But there, I just sitting was just sitting here a minute ago and I noticed there was this conflict, and so I brought it up. And how you want to resolve that, I think, is fair fair, fair for discussion. But I just wanted to point out <clears throat> that there was that conflict, and I'm not sure what, what if the intent was to exempt it from all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight categories across that table, or just the, that last column. Councilor Cotton. Why I agree with Councilmember Holloway. Why can't we just make the text and the table correct together so that everybody understands when referring to both sides of this that? I mean, it doesn't seem that it would be that difficult for us to be able to fix both the text and the table to be correct. Um, I think we can definitely look into a way to do that. Uh, I don't have an example of what that language would look like for you right now, but um, that's something that we could work to resolve. Probably before we approve it. Councilor Johnson. Yeah, so it sounds to me like this may not be ready to go tonight. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to go back to committee. Uh, I would let the council decide if they think we need to do that. It could be as simple as uh, staff goes back, takes a look at it. They come with the specific change with what exactly it would look like. And then we could adopt it then. Um, it seems like this is small enough that with... Um, uh, interim city, city attorney's help, uh, staff might be able to get that done without it having to go through another cycle of um, committee review, but um, that's my thought. Councilor Benson? Is this something that could be done in just a few minutes and we come back to it after we do other stuff? Is that legal? Do we have to amend the uh, <laughs> agenda? To... I'll just take off. Um, Councilor Christensen? I think in this case, if our city attorney isn't clear about whether the exemption is to just the 65 days or to the additional items on the table, I think it's probably better done as a research question than brought back for review. I'm comfortable um, with it not going to committee if the committee is comfortable with that and having it just come back to council, but I don't sit on that committee, so I would defer. Mayor Pro Tem Holloway. So I'm looking for staff and, and my legal advice to provide me some clarity, and I'm not getting it. So I motion that this be tabled till next council and then it go back to committee for review prior to coming back to council. We've got till January to do this. May I have a second? Second. So I move by Mayor Pro Tem Holloway, second by Councilor Christensen <clears throat> to table and move it back to committee to make the corrections. Um, Councilor Johnson? Uh, since we have done one reading, if it does go back to committee, do we have to do two readings again? Uh, I think no, if you're just making a correction. No. Okay. Yeah, we'll okay. make the motion and make, we'll probably may have to make a motion to revise because we've already done one reading, whatever the revision is recommended from staff. Councilor Johnson. Also, uh, I just realized that I think that we are, unless that's a superseding motion, we're uh, two or three dinosaurs deep. So I just want to make sure that I understand where exactly this is because I had made a motion to make the change. Do I need to retract that, or does sending it back to committee override my motion to amend? I think you probably need two four years back. Make a motion to send that question right. to committee. All right. Then uh, I retract my motion if my second, <laughs> whomever that was, is Vincent. Vincent. Did I say? I don't remember. Councillor Benson, I think you seconded his motion. Uh, so sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So then the motion then is to table it and take it back to committee. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? 
Right, so the motion passes to move back to committee. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, okay. moving on to AB 24-102, revising the corporate boundary of the city of Snoqualmie mm -hmm. to include a portion of 384th Avenue Southeast right away. This is the second reading of Ordinance 1297. Okay. Councilor Benson, would you please read the introduction and motion? This agenda bill seeks approval to revise the corporate boundary of the city of Suquamish to include 384th Avenue Southeast right of way from Southeast River Street to the southern edge of Kimball Creek Drive intersection. Move to adopt Ordinance 1297 reg regarding revising the corporate boundary of the city of Suquamish to include a portion of 384th Avenue Southeast right of way. Second. Moved by Councillor Benson, second by Councillor Watton. Is there any public comment regarding this item? Seeing none, Council, any discussion? Or do you have any further questions regarding this? Do you have any questions for Patrick? Councilor Benson. Uh, just for clarity, I think this was, we're just adding the other side of the street to our to our boundary to make street repairs and maintenance more Side seamless. Block. Right. And we have Patrick Fry, the project engineer. Evening, Patrick Fry, project engineer for the city. Thank you, Mayor Ross. Uh, yes, exactly. We're just trying, we're moving the boundary from the eastern side of 384th to the western side of 384. So it's not gonna encompass any of the homes on the western side, just the road. So, just the road. So none of the residents are affected. None of them will really know. Uh, it'll just make. We can tell them it's not like a secret or anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions for Patrick? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Nay. Okay, well, there's, Five, four, and Mayor Pro Tem Holloway is opposed. So it has passed. AB 24 102, revising the corporate boundary of the city of Snoqualmie to include the portion of 384th right away. Next item is AB 24 089, school impact fees for 2025. This is the first reading of Ordinance 1294. Mayor Pro Tem Holloway, would you please read the introduction? Annual update to the school impact fees for 2025 on behalf of the Sequoia Valley School District number 410. Just the introduction the tonight. Okay. So is there any public comment regarding this item? Seeing none, it looks like we have Andrew ready to address this. Is that correct? Um, I'm just here to uh, walk, yes, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm walk, I'll walk you through the proposed changes, um, the changes proposed by this ordinance. Um, in effect, this ordinance would adopt the, uh, modify the municipal code to adopt the fees specified by the Snoqualmie Valley School District uh, six-year capital improvement plan. Um, this is kind of part one to this, uh, the actions needed to adopt the uh, fees and the, and the plan, the other part being AB 90, which we'll address later. However, this uh, portion would modify the code to um, make the impact fees for a single family residence, a new single family residence increase from $9,230.89 to $10,187.76 and a multifamily unit decrease uh, from $6,391.47 to $6,170.35. Council, do you have any questions? We also have Ryan Stokes from the school district as well. Mayor Pritam Holloway. But just to be clear, this is the city adopting the school district's impact fees, mm -hmm. merely 
as a go between administrative. We are we are we did not change those fees. We're just a pass through. Right. Okay. Do you have any comments or questions? All right. So we will vote on it during the next meeting. Um, any other questions? No. So second reading will be November 12th. Thank you, Andrew. Next item is committee reports. Is there a public safety committee report? Uh, nothing at this moment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there a community development committee report? Uh, no report. All right. Um, first report for Parks and Public Works is AB 24-116, Reclaimed Water System Improvement Project. Councilman Benson, would you please read the introduction? The city produces and distributes Class A reclaimed water during dry season months for non-drinking uses, such as landscape irrigation. Re reclaimed water is wastewater that gets treated to such a high level that it can be used safely for irrigation. By using reclaimed water, the city preserves potable water resources for drinking water purposes. The reclaimed water reservoir improvements will upgrade the dated reclaimed water distribution system and bring it into compliance with current standards. And this is discussion only, no action. Members of the public are invited to provide public comments related to these proposed improvements. Great. Thank you. So tonight we have project engineer Andrew Vining here to introduce our presenter, and then we will have public comment following the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, Andrew Vining, uh, Public Works Project Engineer. Uh, I am going to be introducing RH2 Engineering, uh, who is they are working on wrapping up design on the reclaimed water distribution system improvements. Uh, we're currently soliciting public comments now through November 14th as part of the final design and the uh, environmental SEPA review currently underway. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Barney Santiago from uh, RH2. Great, well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Mayor Ross, council and all attendees. I'm Barney Santiago, project manager with RH2 Engineering. And I'll provide an overview and update on the reclaimed water system uh, improvements project. So next slide. So here's a quick overview of the existing reclaimed water system. Um, as Andrew uh, mentioned, it's a uh, reclaimed water is a resource. The city is fortunate enough to treat wastewater generated within the city to a high level to be reused for irrigation. And this conserves the city's drinking water sources uh, and keeps them set for potable use. High quality class A reclaimed water is piped from the water reclamation facility to Eagle Lake. On average, 18 million gallons of reclaimed water is distributed yearly to city customers, offsetting 15% of peak drinking water demand. And the main problem is that this reclaimed water in Eagle Lake is degraded after it blends with storm water. So next slide. So we looked at two options to preserve the high quality irrigation waters. Um, the first one is to transition irrigation customers to potable supply, or we can separate city irrigation water from Eagle Lake. So to conserve high quality drinking water sources, we went with alternative two, which requires a new reservoir and pump station. Next slide. So what will these improvements cost? We estimate about 8.6 million for the reservoir, pump station, and site utilities. The State Department of Ecology awarded the city 6.8 million low interest loan, and they recently applied for additional state funding. The city is coordinating with a golf course on acquiring the land and is also performing a rate study to determine how the reclaimed utility costs will be shared. Next slide. So here's a sneak peek of our design and of the new infrastructure. The storage tank will be a 470,000 gallon partially buried concrete reservoir. The irrigation pump station is a 900 square foot building with CMU walls and metal roof. We're gonna be matching the existing irrigation pumps with two duty pumps and one small jockey pump to keep the pressure. The existing site is pretty fairly wooded, but we're gonna be removing about 100 trees, which will mitigate by landscaping the site with native trees. There's no critical areas impacted with the new infrastructure. And ultimately this project will ensure that high quality class A reclaimed water is preserved for city irrigation purposes. And that's all I had. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Barney. Uh, Barney's doing an excellent job moving this project along. He was involved in the North Wellfield treatment facility improvements that we completed as part of the phase one project. And then also 
um, the treatment facility at our Canyon Springs site. Right. Thank you. So now I'll ask, is there any public comment regarding this item? And seeing none, Councilor Cotton? Uh, yes, I had a question. Have we um, received affirmation that both Department of Ecology and Health are going to continue to waive um, us being able to um, uh, keep the reservoir without or the irrigation lines without chlorine or chlorination um, to meet the NPDES permit. Um, I realize it's a not a loop irrigation system, so um, there was that question of kind of doing one or the other where leaving the port where we could inject chlorine in an emergency if we needed to, or, uh, but I wanted to know if we've got those um, uh, waivers still in place or coming through. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, we did receive a formal letter from Department of Ecology who works as the lead reviewer. They work with Department of Health and they provided a, a formal waiver of that um, chlorine residual. Um, there are conditions in that which we're incorporating to design. Part of that is um, providing the opportunity for maintenance chlorination. So periodic kind of shot cleaning at the beginning and end of the season mm -hmm. to the reservoir and um, having the pump station on site um, provides us with those additional controls and incorporates it into our SCADA system. So we can, we always have control of the water at all times. Great. Councilor Cotton, follow up. A second question also. So with the, um, the financial aspects of things, um, is there going to be a purchase price for the land that we're getting from the um, uh, golf course and are we still working on that or, and is this gonna be a separate um, uh, request coming forward for, for that, those monies or will that be included in the overall project? That's, yeah, that's an agenda bill that uh, I'm working on and we've, we've had the, pro the property valued uh, by a evaluation consultant and um, we'll be incorporating that into our our total project budget. So um, there is an administrative cost that's in the project budget. Um, I'll be working with finance on that, but we do have a valuation. We've been in close communication with the property owner. So I would imagine later this month, we'll be bringing an agenda bill forward on that. Thanks. Great question. Councilor Benson. Uh, yeah, uh, in the description, it sounded like is the golf course no longer going to be using Eagle Lake at all for um, for the, its own irrigation, or it, will it will it be using the uh, the reservoir as well? So, uh, the requirement for the city is to um, remove the city's portion. Uh, the golf course has their portion um, that they use on site. There, they're allowed to keep using that. Um, they are looking at um, rebuilding their pump station. Uh, but uh, that's as much information I've, I ha as I have at this point. <laughs> Mayor Pritchett, Tim Holloway. But clarification, the golf course is going to be pulling from Eagle Lake, not this new reservoir, or is that still in question? You're correct. Uh, the golf course will be pulling from Eagle Lake. They will have zero connection to our reservoir. Pastor Christensen. If they're pulling solely from Eagle Lake, are we anticipating that we're going to be getting a drop in revenue to the utilities then from what they would normally be paying to irrigate the golf course? That's still reclaimed water. For, for the Wait, just a second. I think it's to Andrew. Andrew, you have a response? You, is the, sorry, is the question regarding rates for um, specific golf course customer? Is yeah. That, um, we would be reviewing that in our rate study. Um, I, I'd probably have to defer to finance, but I don't anticipate any changes based on the infrastructure. We're providing the same product, essentially. Uh, they, they would still pay for the reclaimed water that goes to Eagle Lake. Okay. 
okay so that we still that revenue source is still there okay he's he's mentioned we're in the rate change right now yeah so what the exact dollar figure don't know but based on eru's going into that lake they would pay for that irrigation okay so we're, okay thank you and then Councilor benson yeah the, the city has different requirements on the water that it uses for irrigation within the city than the private pl uh, golf course does so they they don't have the same constraints yeah, I understood that. I just didn't know if they were pulling from Eagle Lake, then whether the city was still dealing with we still, the water before that's it still, goes in, and yeah. then whether that would still be metered going out, basically. Yeah. I, I asked the question in a really unclear way, so I apologize. No, you did great. <laughs> yeah. the, on, the only clarification I would add is the reason that we have the separate standards is that we um, own and operate a distribution system that is a public distribution system, which has those requirements, the golf course it goes to their property, so there is no distribution system that is the, the point of use, essentially. Okay. Any other questions regarding this? So the next item then is AB 24-112, which is Reclaimed Water System Improvements Project Amendment to RH2 Professional Services Agreement. Councilor Benson, would you please read the introduction and motion? This agenda bill seeks to amend the existing professional services agreement with RH2 Engineering to design and permit a new reclaimed water irrigation pump station to operate adjacent to the new reservoir. These improvements will upgrade the dated reclaimed water distribution system and bring, into compli bring it into compliance with current state standards. I uh, move to approve amendment number two to the Eagle Lake Water Reclamation Basin Improvement Services Agreement with RH2 Engineering for Design Services. Second. Been moved by Councilor Benson, second by Councilor Watton. Is there any public comment regarding this item? Seeing none. Do we have any further questions for Arthur Vining? Arthur, <laughs> Andrew Vining. So we got to pump this water? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? And the motion passes unanimously for AB 24-112 Reclaimed Water System Improvement Project Amendment to the RH2 Professional Services Agreement. So last report for Parks and Public Works is AB 24-117 Agreement with Northwest Hydraulic Consultants for the 2025 Stormwater Comprehensive Plan. Councilor Benson, would you please read the introduction and motion? The city seeks to contract with Northwest Hydraulic Consultants to update and complete the 2025 update of the City of Snoqualmie's Stormwater Comprehensive Plan. Move to adopt Resolution 1699, awarded, awarding a professional services agreement to Northwest Hydraulic Consultants for the 2025 Stormwater Comprehensive Plan update. Second. Moved by Councilor Benson and second by Councilor Cotton. Is there any public comment regarding this item? Seeing none, we have Patrick Fry, who is the project engineer, here to present this item. Evening, Council, Mayor, staff. Um, All right, so as mentioned, this agenda bill is seeking to uh, contract with NHC uh, to complete and up water, or update the stormwater system plan. And so just a little bit of background, uh, way back in 2018, we originally contracted with NHC to complete a stormwater system plan. Uh, yet in 2019, new NPDS requirements came out uh, with the SMAP requirements, uh, that's the Stormwater Management Action Plan. Uh, I would have brought a number of items to you guys last year uh, about the SMAP. Uh, if you don't remember it, it's really just a comprehensive look at all of our basins in the city. Uh, and essentially, we had to target a basin about which one that we want to um, clean up, essentially, or take actions to, to clean up. 
And if we had uh, continued creating the stormwater system plan uh, and then created the SMAP, it, it essentially would have ruled that uh, system plan obsolete already by the time we finished the SMAP. And so we halted the uh, system plan and had NHC shift gears to work on the SMAP instead. Now with the SMAP complete, uh, we're looking to have them go back, shift gears back to that system plan and complete it. And so, as mentioned, they, they worked on this system plan already for a significant chunk of time, and they already completed uh, a fairly complete draft. Not complete, but fairly complete. And so there are, these are the existing ch 10 chapters already. It's hundreds of pages long. Uh, again, it's all draft, but it's still a, a, a large document with lots of good information in it. And so for this 2024 scope, uh, what we are looking to do is review the existing info and kind of finish it, right? Complete all the information that's already in it. As well as that, we're going to add a capital facilities plan chapter. Uh, so that is projects that we would like to do uh, and should be done with their general costs, you know, really high level planning costs, uh, which that's a standard chapter in all utility plans. It's in our water utility plan and our wastewater utility plan. Uh, and we also are going to add a chapter on basin identification analysis and deficiencies. So that's going to be pretty similar to this map. It's going to be taking this map and putting it into this chapter, making it uh, part of this document, as well as completing our regulatory and O&M review. So that's you know just how we're going to stay in compliance with NPDES requirements, as well as just compiling all of our uh, documents for O&M and making it into one comprehensive document that, you know, it's our, it's our stormwater Bible as opposed to a bunch of different documents that, that we have right now. Well, and how are we going to pay for it? Uh, the total project cost is going to be $163,000 to finish this. And uh, we will pay for it because uh, as part of the 23-24 stormwater biennium, we are intent or we are expecting to underspend by just shy of $200,000 uh, for the 23-24 biennium. And the reason that we are going to be shy that call it $200,000 is mostly due to Phil Bennett uh, being promoted to the deputy, which means his p position has been vacated. So we have uh, additional funding in the stormwater funds uh, for the year. And so we're gonna use that money to, to pay for it. And that's it. Council, do we have any questions? Councilor Johnson. So um, <clears throat> what I didn't see uh, specifically, and it was probably because, uh, or it could be because I don't understand what all of these sub parts would be to okay. this very broad outline, um, but was uh, anything about uh, kind of projecting forward, taking trends and potential changes in uh, uh, the weather and climate and then kind of projecting forward. And the reason I bring it up <clears throat> is my understanding is that some cities that built their stormwater system say, I'm gonna make up a number, but say 70 years ago, okay? Uh, were uh, in Western Washington, uh, built those systems for much longer, uh, but slower drizzly weather. And that one of the things that has happened in some parts of the Pacific Northwest is that uh, storms have become shorter and more intense. So it's a very similar volume of water overall, but when it's coming in different amounts, uh, then you could have a system that becomes very quickly overwhelmed, and then uh, they have to rebuild those systems because they didn't know that was gonna happen. Um, but uh, by having kind of that forward thinking, looking to the future, uh, perhaps we could avoid some of those mistakes if we build for current weather, if there's a really good reason based on data to think that that kind of weather as a result of a change in climate um, could change the need in the future. Excellent point. So um, this is going to broadly touch on, you know, the trends uh, that we'll be expecting to see in terms of stormwater. Um, but what you are uh, talking about is likely going to be defined more in the projects that get done. So that would be the uh, capital facilities plan chapter. And so these are gonna be 
what projects should we be looking at to do for the stormwater? And so part of them is uh, those SMAP, the Stormwater Management Action Plan, and that's essentially retrofitting our existing infrastructure, um, you know, updating it, whatever we want to do with that. And that's going to capture that kind of uh, work in there. Um, but really, the how exactly we're going to be dealing that is going to be done when we're planning those projects, um, as opposed to this document, which, you know, the facilities plan chapter is going to touch on, we should add a pond here or add vaults here or whatever these projects that we decide. Deeper gutters. Deeper gutters. And um, then when we actually go in to design the projects, we're going to be looking at, okay, what are the trends for stormwater exactly? How much do we need to be capturing? What, what do we want to do to make these uh, projects future-proof? Does that make sense and answer your question a little bit? I think so. I was just going to say, Chapter 6 is going to model the existing system. Mm -hmm. um, chapter 8 is going to identify existing draining it, it issues. And then um, Chapter 9 is going to do what you talk about, which is to come up with the, how to fix it. So, yes. Right. Well put. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? And the agreement with North Northwest Hydraulic Consultants for 2025 Stormwater Comprehensive Plan is unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Move on to anything else from Parks and Public Works Committee? Nothing else. Okay. Move on to Finance Administration Committee. We have AB 24-090, adoption of the Snoqualmie Valley School District Capital Facilities Plan 2024-2029. Mayor Patrick Mahalloway, would you please read the introduction and motion? Annual update to the Snoqualmie Valley School District Capital Facilities Plan for 2024 through 2029 to enable the city to collect updated uh, impact fee amounts in 2025 on behalf of the school district. Um, move to approve resolution 1696 adopting the Sacoma Valley School District number 410 capital facilities plan 2024 through 2029. May I have a second? Second. Been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Holloway, second by Councilor Christensen to approve AB 24 090. Is there any public comment regarding this item? Seeing none, um, we do have our community development director, Emily Arteche, here to present this item, or Andrew. Good evening again. Um, as I had mentioned before, uh, AB 24-090 is uh, the resolution to adopt the Snoqualmie Valley School District's um, upcoming capital facilities plan uh, by reference into the city's comprehensive plan. Um, this is the part two of the uh, ordinance that would update the fees in the city's um, municipal code. Also, do we have any questions? We also have Ryan Stokes here, mentioned earlier. Do you have any questions? Councilor Benson. Yeah, it looks like we're looking at a about a thousand dollar increase for single family residences, and um, decrease for multifamily reference re residences. Um, what was the thinking behind that? So the precise amounts are based on the student generation that each type of um, unit is expected to create during the planning period. If we want to get into the nuances of, about it, I think maybe Ryan can speak to that. Are we are we thinking that there's going to be five times as many or four times as many students coming from single family residences or the average single family re residence than? No. Uh, Ryan Stokes, Assistant Superintendent for Snoqualmie Valley School District. Thank you for the question. Uh, the primary driver of the cost increase is the increase of construction cost for the for the projects. And then there's some diff 
The difference between the single family and the multifamily has to do with assessed valuations. There is a tax credit that is incorporated into the fee calculation that gives the new homeowner essentially a credit for the next 10 years of school taxes that they would be paying. <clears throat> the assessed value for single families went down by 15% and that drives our tax rate. That increases our tax rate because most of our valuation is in single families. The multifamily assessed valuation went up. And so the multifamily <clears throat> went up with a tax rate increase. And so their credit for the future taxes got is much bigger than the single family. So because most of our value is in single family homes, the multifamily and single family tend to move opposite from each other. One will, one will get bigger and one will get smaller because of what's going on with the assessed valuation. Thank you. So you're not out to get, get anybody. No, it was just, uh, most of it was cost escalation. So you're building a school and it's another year out. We didn't get to, uh, we aren't to where we're going to start putting it on a bond. And so the timeline for that construction moved out a year and the associated escalation of, of the inflation increased the overall cost. And that was the main driver of the cost increase. Thank you. That was really well explained. You're welcome. <clears throat> Councilor, any more questions? Okay. Seeing, on, seeing none, moving on to vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed nay? So it's unanimous and the AB 24-090 adoption of Snoqualmie Valley School District Capital Facilities Plan has passed. Thank you. Next item is AB 24-104 2025 salary schedule for non-represented management and professional employees. Mayor Pro Tem Holloway, would you please read the introduction and motion? The purpose of the agenda bill is for the council consideration and approval of the 2025 salary schedule for non-represented management and professional employees. And, uh, with no particular preference, but at least to start the conversation, move to approve the 2025 salary schedule for non-represented management and professional employees with a 2.68 COLA. May I have a second? Second. Been moved by Mayor Tim Holloway, second by Councillor Watton. Um, is there any public comment regarding that item? Seeing none, we have our finance director, Drew Boutte, here to present this item. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Uh, before you tonight is the approval for MMP COLAs for 2025. As part of this agenda bill, we have produced three options for Council's consideration tonight. Uh, the first one, as read in by the mayor pro tem, is option number one, which would include a 2.68% COLA for 2025. This is the percentage that was incorporated into the 25-26 biennial budget. Um, the proposed 2025 COLA of 2.68% was based on a forecast of the consumer price index for urban wage earners uh, released by the King County Office of Economic Financial Analysis in March of 2024. The 2.68% COLA was then used to estimate the 25 salaries and benefits for MM, MMP employees in early June of 2024, and then rolled into the biennial budget that council adopted uh, fairly recently on October the 3rd. In addition, uh, the other two options include option number two, which would uh, be a 3.5% COLA increase. Um, this is tracking with what we've typically done historically. So COLAs previously received by MMP employees typically were based on an average of the three other employee groups, Teamsters, uh, police, and fire. And usually based on the majority of those three employee groups, um, expect what they expected to receive for the upcoming year. Uh, in 2025, both the Teamsters and fire employee groups will receive a 2025 COLA of 3.5%. And therefore, approving this COLA would adhere to really the past practices of the, of the city. Option number three includes a 3.63% COLA, so just slightly more than the 3.5% COLA in option number two. Um, the actual June of 2023 to June of 2024 CPIW for the Seattle, Tacoma, Bellevue area was 3.63%. So we're actually using some hard data basically uh, to support this option. In addition, most of our neighboring municipalities are planning on COLA increases um, roughly around the same amount. And in fact, this is a question that Councilmember Christensen brought up at the FNA committee. And if council will permit me, I will just share my screen. 
here shortly so that we can answer that question with this. So the average of a group of cities that our HR team has collected, uh, Kim Johnson, HR manager, roughly the average uh, for the next year proposed for 2025 is roughly 4.15%. And so these were comparable cities that were included in the class and comp study back in 2022. Um, we will note that there are some that haven't responded to our email request, so it's not the full list of comp cities, but we think it's a pretty well-represented group that we have here. Um, with that said, because we did budget 2.68% as a COLA for um, 2025, if council does choose to approve a 3.5% COLA or a 3.63% COLA, choosing one of the other two options, uh, that will mean that we will be exceeding what we had budgeted for those um, MMP employees for 2025. And so consequently, the total cost above and beyond what we budgeted for option number two would be roughly $31,000 spread across all funds. And option number three would be roughly about $36,000 more than what we had budgeted uh, for 2025 spread across all funds. Um, the general fund impact under option number two would be roughly $23,000 and option number three would be roughly $27,000. So um, in summation, council has three options before them uh, tonight for consideration, and thank you for your time. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions? Councilor Benson? Well, I don't think I like Brian's motion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just looking at these comps, I don't think it would reflect well on us. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about the difficulties hiring uh, employees, and um, I'm certainly not looking to lose any city employees. So uh, it seems to me that, um, well, I'm just, you know, I, 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 I don't want to speak for anybody. I know that if it were me and I was a city employee looking at this list, and I was proposed a cost of living increase of 2.68%, I would wonder how I had screwed up or somehow offended the council. Um, so uh, I think that, I think we need to consider um, being more in alignment with our neighboring cities uh, if, that's, if that's fiscally possible. Councilor Watton. I have two questions. One is besides the the actual pay, have we changed, remind me, have we changed any other compensation and benefits that are not reflected in this? That was my first question. And the second one, can you, can you again reference the difference in our city budget as far as the total costs uh, of the higher of the three options? So, in essence, to answer your first question, no, there are no changes proposed as a part of this when it comes to the benefits package that we're offering to our MMP employees. Um, this is just strictly focused on the COLA. And then number two, uh, for your second question, the impact for option number three, which is the 3.63% increase, would result in roughly $36,000 more than what we had budgeted across all funds. Uh, so if you're looking at just specifically the general fund, that impact would be roughly $27,000 more than we, what we budgeted. Uh, for all the other funds, uh, that's roughly $9,000 spread across water, sewer, stormwater, uh, internal service funds, all that kind of stuff. So uh, the degree to which I think we'll be able to find those reductions, right, in order to sustain this, I think it's definitely possible. Um, I'll just mean maybe a little bit of effort, right, amongst our directors to be able to achieve that, so. Thank you, Councilor Johnson. <clears throat> yeah, two things. First, um, well, it's been a little bit too long since I took a statistics class, so I, I, I haven't calculated the p-values for these numbers here, but I think that one of those is a statistical outlier that's raising the average a little bit. Um, I'm not sure by exactly how much, but just wanted to point that out. Um, but uh, more importantly, uh, I do think that uh, there is an important um, kind of psychosociological message sent with our past city practice of uh, approving colas that are kind of in line with uh, what we went with um, for uh, uh, for representative staff. Uh, 
so I'm rather partial to the uh, middle way, um, but I'm not prepared to make a motion. I want to hear what the rest of the council thinks. Pro Tim Holloway. Well, and in in regards to this, I, there's there's maybe a piece of data missing. I don't know where these cities are on where their salaries are and then what the percentage are. I, I could make an assumption here that Arlington underpays their employees and they're trying to catch up. I don't know. There could be something else going on. I don't know. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what to do with this in my thinking. Uh, the other part is I, I don't want to set a precedence that I'm going to handle m &P differently than I handle my other job classifications. Um, I mean, if we do, if we were to do this for MMP, are we going to go back to those uh, other co union representative areas and bring them up to what we do because uh, of this? I, so I too am tending toward the the middle. Councilor Cotton, um, referring to the the chart on our packet, it's page three hundred. It's the annual cost of living adjustments that has the CPIs on it. Um, anyway, what I was noticing was that the CPIs, the the average is about four point two percent. Is looking from two hundred from two thousand eighteen to twenty five, and then I was looking at the averages for our other um, union uh, representations of what uh, what we've budgeted for for them, and certainly it seems that we would need to at least uh, my feeling would be keep up with with what we're doing for everybody else as well since we're not apparently raising any other uh areas in in their benefit package with at least going with the higher level of the the cola since it was above what we were anticipating <laughs> it was going to be Pastor christensen yeah, so for for me at least, the op option number one is is not something that I'm willing to support. I don't think that it sounds like anybody over here is as either. But uh, just to put that out there initially, I initially asked the question just because I know that as we went through the salary study last year, the the kind of focus that we'd ha had was basically on catch up and then keep up, right? We just paid for this lovely salary schedule and to have the survey done to figure out what we need to pay our employees, and then the hope was that we would continue moving that up so that we can continue to attract and retain the type of talent that we want. Um, I certainly understand the Mayor Pro Tem's argument in terms of treating MNP professionals the same as we're treating um, the union represented employees as well. I can appreciate that. Um, and the reason that I'd asked for this was just so that I could have a better frame of reference, just to this, but um, the uh, the other local cities for, for comparisons was so that I could have a better idea of, of exactly whether it was more the Arlington was offering the higher or whether it was Issaquah and whether we should really be concerned. Um, I, I still would personally be more inclined to go with option three for M and P. Um, I understand if the support isn't necessarily there and I understand the reasons why it wouldn't be, but for me personally, I would be inclined to go with option three. Councilor Brinson. Can we look at that last table again? Yeah. I remember some of those math words that you were talking about. I know that the the, the mode on here is 3.60, right? That's the one that, that shows up the most. And I think there's only two numbers on this list that are below that mode. Um, and the mean is above option three. Now, I think that your point about the outliers uh, raising that up is a good one, um, but we would also be an outlier if we went with option one. Um, so, uh, I'm 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 with council councilwoman Christensen about option three. I think that's I think that's probably where we, where we want to be. Um, uh, if it if it's if it's fiscally responsible. Uh, that's my thoughts. Councilor Watton. And 
I would I would err on the side of being as generous as possible because retention continues to be a huge issue. I think we could call on Ms. Johnson to give us a more specific, but you know, if you look at the the retention pay system that we have in place, um, that zero to three may be the biggest risk that we have where, you know, what's the incentive for staying? I don't know, but I'd rather keep employees than risk losing employees in this environment. And it hasn't gotten any better in the last year and a half. There's still a challenge of trying to find the right people and keep the right people. Good point. Any other comments? So we it's currently have a motion. Make, somebody motion. wants to make a motion. You already <laughs> made a motion. We have some motion. Have the motion to revise, otherwise it goes. 2.68. Okay. Could you read back the motion? Just to approve the 2025 salary schedule for non represented management and professional. Mm -hmm. MMP employees with a 2.68 cold percent cold. Okay. I, I motion the Lord, particularly to force this conversation. <laughs> uh, move to revise the motion to re reflect that it would approve the 2025 salary schedule for non represented management and professional MMP employees with a 3.63 percent COLA. Second. Second. Okay. okay. Moved by Councilmember Christensen, second by Councilmember. Cotton to um, revise the motion from 2.68% to 3.63% COLA. Any further discussion on this? Councilor Johnson? Yeah, my uh, concern is very much in line with uh, what I heard mentioned earlier that I don't know why we uh, didn't give that much of a COLA to our represented staff and why we're having conversation over that. 0.13% uh, for M and P. Um, I I don't think it's reasonable to think that uh, staff is going to run away because of 0.13%. Um, but I do think that for uh, employees that are further down the um, uh, down the totem pole, that can start to add up to a lot. And I think that that's different from people who are higher up on the totem pole. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, that there's a, a psychological message uh, that's sent by raising MNP higher than our represented staff. Um, and uh, yeah, there you go. Councilor okay. Christensen. Um, again, I, I certainly appreciate that. I, I don't know if, if I find it as persuasive in this case because we didn't get the figures until August. And I think that we'd entered into those contracts ahead, and I would hope that we'll continue to evaluate and look at the CPIW as we go forward and negotiate new contracts with the commission, or at least as we go back through and look at them as drafted into the contracts. Does that make sense? You're squinting. <laughs> Councilor Johnson. It would make sense if uh, we then went back to those contracts and revisited them now that they have that information. Those are signed contracts for several years. Yeah. So we cannot yes, reopen no. contracts. Thank you. Any other Councilor Benson? I think it is fair to say that there's a certain there's a certain aspect of timing that's always going to uh, factor into any of these negotiations. And um to go back and, and readjust every contract because of the different timing of another contract, I don't think is I, uh, I think that that's that's not a sustainable. I mean, we'll have another contract negotiation eventually for for those salaries, I believe. Okay, hey, Councilor Johnson. Our uh, past practice would have mitigated that concern by raising everyone together, lifting all boats. Do we, Councilor Benson? Do we usually? do all of these contracts simultaneously or uh, they, 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 they come through at, at, at different times and. Right. They're different years. Yeah. Councilor Johnson. Yeah. But um, it would be that MNP would have reflected the raises that we gave to 
the representative and um, represented employees. So then by that rationale, the next time there's a contract negotiation, those 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 who are negotiating that contract can point to this decision, right? Councilor Johnson? I absolutely agree. They will probably look back and think we need to go further north in future contract negotiations. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Holloway. I can't remember. Did did the police or fire contract have a CPI escalator? Or both? Our city administrator, Chambliss. So we haven't begun fire. Um, we're scheduled to begin that in January. Um, both police and Teamsters negotiated a complete package that included the CPIs for a period of time. Um, they are different in the two, two contracts, um, but along with other things were, were different also. There's a little bit of apples and oranges being discussed because M&P does not negotiate, um, and this is, is not a not a package it's it's a cola piece but Mayor Tim Holloway. the for those two represented areas what their raises next year will be adjusted by what the cpi was the year prior correct okay if we do this now for the mnps we're going to be here next year saying oh because of the same cpi part, period we're talking now those two get an additional raise, and NMP is going to have to catch up, which, in essence, we jump them ahead of schedule. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear. So I am really reluctant to go beyond what we negotiated with the other representative areas for this area because, depending on schedule, you may actually be double. Again, we don't take the long view of show me a graph of where all these have gone. We're looking at one year. I, I don't know if we're double hitting or whatever, but again, I that's why I think the out of state lockstep we treat the non rep just the same as the reps. Councilor Benson, you know, I, I think that I think the the issue that I would take with that is that there are well, to city administrator channels' point, there are, there are a lot of factors that go into each and every one of these contracts and they're not all the same factors in each one um and so we did i think you said we we negotiate a package in those contracts um and i think that the difference that i see here is that because they're not represented um there is a consideration that we have to that we have to give to that fact as well and that the package that, that we're talking about with M&P is not necessarily as complicated as some of these other contracts that we're talking about, I think is also a consideration. Um, I don't feel like there's as many moving parts in the M&P negotiation as there is with police, for example. Um, so uh, that's why I feel more, more comfortable making sure that we're Probably comp compensating them so that we don't have to go through the added expense of replacing one of them because they, because they left for, you know, a place with a higher higher number on this chart. Okay, are we ready to vote? We currently have um, the motion on the table is to approve the three point six three percent cola. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Nope. So there were two nays, May Pro, May Pro Tim Holloway and Councilor Johnson, and four ayes. And so the COLA 3.63% has been approved. So thank you. Good discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Drew. Um, next is the 2025 legislative priorities. Mayor Pro Tim Holloway, would you please lead this discussion? Okay. Well, um, and pretty much it is discussion at this stage. So I know there's been some discussions at committees. Again, I'm not proposing to uh, wrap this up in a letter we all sign off, but as soon as we get through the silly season, I'll call election season. 
uh, at least to invite legislators, our respective legislators to come in and have a discussion with us on all these lines. Uh, I know public safety has had some discussion. There was a brief discussion in FNA. Um, I guess my question is, were there discussion in other committees in regards to these, or uh, will you take that action in the next committee round to come take a look at these, see if they're right? I know at least one of them's wrong. Um, I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> what can I say? Um, and again, just in line to get us prepped for conversation of getting our state reps, county reps, bring them all in here and let's have a conversation of what we think is important for Suquamish and their venues. So are you coming up with a master list then? There was a brief list uh, sent out last, well, distributed last council meeting, mm -hmm. briefly discussed in part in the committees. I know public safety did, and like I said, FNA did. Mm -hmm. I'm just reinforcing if the other committees could have those conversations too, take a look at that. Uh, if you want another copy of it, let me know. Um, and then we'll start to proceed into, um, and give me any input, I'll do a revised list uh, and have it out for committees so I can correct at least the error I know I have in there. Um, and let's have those discussions. Uh, let's keep this going. Discussions, going, ongoing discussion with, like I said, an eventual meeting with our associated reps. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Councilor I'm not Biden. coming to conclusion tonight. Councilor Biden. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. Uh, I know that Clerk Dean sent out to at least the Public Safety Committee an update with things we kind of roughed out and discussed. Was that shared with the entire council or? Just with you. Yeah. Oh, just with me? Oh, okay. It was only for me. Oh, my goodness. No, I, that's <laughs> okay. I Thank you for talking so about it. tired that. of the special treatment. Oh my gosh. So, so would it be acceptable to send out what we've kind of already without discussion, knowing that it's only going to stay in everybody's inbox so that there's transparency for the other council members, particularly my committee members to see what's written in there. And we can come back later in council and kind of refine those together. I can send it to everyone. We just we just won't talk amongst ourselves. We'll just look at it individually. Okay. Councilor Benson, I I would I would love to have it as a discussion in Parks and Public Works yeah. during the committee. We extended our last meeting to ninety minutes and used used I think ninety one minutes of that <laughs> last time. So I don't know how. I don't know. I don't know what uh, I haven't looked at our schedule for the for the next Parks and Public Works committee meeting yet, but maybe we need to extend that meeting as well to accommodate this discussion. Uh, if you guys would be amenable to that. And um, would that be OK with you, City Clerk Dean, or do you only do this for public safety? <laughs> <laughs> we're not the ones making her come early or stay late to ours though um i mean if you'd like to start at 4 30 i can certainly let's do it make that happen yeah okay All right. yeah if, if, let's do that then we can add it to the planning schedule somebody's in the planning schedule at the moment so i can't do that moment but um yeah we can do that okay. thank you sounds good any other comments all right okay moving on to the mayor's report um, so first of all, happy National First, Re First Responders Day. We recognize and honor the women and men of the Snoqualmie Police and Fire Departments. Thank you for our fire firefighters and police officers who work to keep Snoqualmie residents safe. Thank you. And I attended ribbon cutting this past weekend for Ash Fine Arts on, on Saturday. So the last council meeting, you um, confirmed appointment of Ashley Hale, who is our newest Snoqualmie Arts Commissioner, and this is her new business. So it's right up her alley with her creativity and talents that she has. And so it's on the second floor on Railroad Avenue above the art gallery. So if you want to visit, you should go up there, see it. Um, 
And then a, a sad moment, a comment. So our hearts go out to the Humiston family, to their friends and neighbors, and the Fall City community. I attended the King County Sheriff community meeting on Saturday morning um, regarding the tragedy. And there they provided local support resources and information. And so I have that information. And so we're going to be putting together um, this information and you know, posting it and sending it out in case you know, people realize that they could use additional assistance. So anyway, that's it. So that's all my comments. Um, is there any commission or committee liaison reports? No? Seeing none? Okay. So the next item is, there you go, an executive session. So time we have executive session pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101AI to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency matters relating to potential litigation. And this will be lasting approximately 15 minutes. I'll say 15. 15 minutes. And let's see. And those attending would be City Attorney, Interim City Attorney David Linehan and City Administrator Mike Chambliss and myself. And so we could take a start off with a five minute recess and then convene at, let's see, so we would be done by 8.50 p.m. No action is anticipated following executive session. So council will adjourn directly from the executive session and not return to open session. The city clerk will be informed of the concluding time, which will be reflected in the meeting minutes. And so we will have our meeting right here and We'll end the the online session. So thank you. So five minute break and the executive session. <laughs> 